The main characters. Calvin. Named after 16th century theologian John Calvin, founder of Calvinism and a strong believer in predestination, Calvin is an impulsive, imaginative, energetic, curious, intelligent, self-centered, and often selfish six-year-old, whose last name the strip never gives. Despite his low grades, Calvin has a wide vocabulary range that rivals that of an adult, as well as an emerging philosophical mind. He commonly wears his distinctive striped shirt. Watterson has described Calvin thus. Calvin is pretty easy to do because he is outgoing and rambunctious, and there's not much of a filter between his brain and his mouth. Williams, 1987. I guess he's a little too intelligent for his age. The thing that I really enjoy about him is that he has no sense of restraint. He doesn't have the experience yet to know the things that you shouldn't do. Dean, 1987. The socialization that we all go through to become adults teaches you not to say certain things because you will later suffer the consequences. Calvin doesn't know that rule of thumb yet. West, 1989. Calvinistic predestination as a philosophical position basically entails the idea that human action plays no part in affecting a person's ultimate salvation or damnation. Calvin's consistent gripe is that the troublesome acts he commits are outside of his control. He is simply a product of his environment, a victim of circumstances. Hobbes. Hobbes is Calvin's stuffed tiger, who, from Calvin's perspective, is as alive and real as anyone else in the strip. He is named after 17th century philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who had what Watterson described as a dim view of human nature. He is famous for his claim that human's natural state is a state of war, where the life of man is solitary, poor, sick, nasty, brutish, and short. Hobbes is much more rational and aware of consequences than Calvin, but seldom interferes with Calvin's troublemaking beyond a few oblique warnings. After all, Calvin will be the one to get in trouble for it, not Hobbes. For the most part, Calvin and Hobbes converse and play together, reveling in what is ultimately a deep friendship. They also frequently argue or even fight with each other, though their disagreements are generally short-lived. Often, Hobbes ambushes Calvin with an energetic pounce-and-tackle attack, which leaves Calvin bruised and scraped up, but not seriously harmed. Hobbes takes great pleasure in his demonstrations of feline prowess, while Calvin expresses keen frustration at his inability to stop the attacks or explain his injuries to his skeptical parents. Watterson based some of Hobbes' characteristics, especially his playfulness and attack instinct, on his own pet cat, Sprite. Hobbes takes great pride in being a feline, and frequently makes wry or even disparaging comments about human nature, declaring his good fortune to lead a tiger's life. In Calvin's philosophical ramblings, it is evident that Hobbes is usually Bill Watterson's voice on the subject, whereas Calvin usually seems to echo the sentiments, or lack thereof, of modern America. It may be otherwise be asserted that Calvin rather portrays an alter ego of Watterson. Interestingly, Hobbes almost never calls Calvin by his name. Instead, he simply uses pronouns when speaking to his human counterpart. Hobbes' Reality From Calvin's point of view, Hobbes is a walking, talking, bipedal tiger, much larger than Calvin and full of his own attitudes and ideas. But when the perspective shifts to any other character, readers see merely a little stuffed tiger. This is, of course, an odd dichotomy, and Watterson explains it thus. When Hobbes is a stuffed toy in one panel and alive in the next, I'm juxtaposing the grown-up version of reality with Calvin's version, and inviting the reader to decide which is truer. Christie, 1987. Many readers assume that Hobbes is either a product of Calvin's imagination or a doll that comes to life when Calvin is the only one around. However, both of these theories are incorrect. As Watterson explains in the 10th anniversary book, Hobbes is more about the subjective nature of reality than dolls coming to life. Thus, there is no concrete definition of Hobbes' reality. Watterson explained, 
Calvin sees Hobbes one way, and everyone else sees Hobbes another way. Hobbes's reality is in the eye of the beholder. The so-called gimmick of Hobbes is the juxtaposition of Calvin and Hobbes's reality rarely mixes well with everyone else's. Sometimes Hobbes breaks the fourth wall and speaks directly to the reader, such as when Calvin tries to parachute from his house's roof. His mom's going to have a fit about those rose bushes. On other occasions, it is difficult to imagine how the stuffed toy interpretation of Hobbes is consistent with what the characters see. For example, he assists Calvin's attempt to become a Houdini-style escape artist by tying Calvin to a chair. Calvin, however, cannot escape, and his irritated father must undo the knots, all the while asking Calvin how he could do this to himself. In a rare interview, Watterson explained his approach to this situation. Calvin's dad finds him tied up, and the question remains, really, how did he get that way? His dad assumes that Calvin tied himself up somehow so well that he couldn't get out. Calvin explains that Hobbes did this to him, and he tries to place the blame on Hobbes entirely, and it's never resolved in the strip. Again, I don't think that's just a cheap way out of the story. I like the tension that that creates, where you've got two versions of reality that do not mix. Something odd has happened, and neither makes complete sense, so you're left to make out of it what you want. West, 1989. In response to the journalist's assumption that Hobbes was a figment of Calvin's imagination, Watterson responded, but the strip doesn't assert that. That's the assumption that adults make because nobody else sees him, sees Hobbes in the way that Calvin does. Some reporter was writing a story on imaginary friends, and they asked me for a comment, and I didn't do it because I really have absolutely no knowledge about imaginary friends. It would seem to me, though, that when you make up a friend for yourself, you would have somebody to agree with you, not to argue with you. So Hobbes is more real than I suspect any kid would dream up. West, 1989. In another story, Susie has to stay at Calvin's house after school because her parents are working late. Calvin only finds this out on the way home. When Calvin and Susie reach the house, Hobbes is waiting by the door for Susie and wearing a tie. But the question is, how is Hobbes wearing the tie? Another instance of ambiguity is a strip in which Calvin imagines Hobbes and himself on the front page of many newspapers after winning a contest. Although these newspapers are clearly a figment of Calvin's imagination, Hobbes appears in stuffed form. Calvin has taken photographs of Hobbes, but on each occasion when adults see the pictures, Hobbes appears as a stuffed toy. Many people feel that the blurred reality between Hobbes's two forms is both amusing and philosophical. Hobbes is often the voice of reason, contrasting Calvin's manic impulsiveness. Readers are left to wonder if this rationality is in Hobbes as a distinct personality, or in Calvin as a kind of conscience. In the end, the question becomes less about absolute truth and more about different versions of reality. The nature of Hobbes's existence was never a puzzle to be solved but rather a subtle comment on the power of imagination and on the similar power of the lack thereof. Supporting characters. Recurring characters. Calvin's family. Calvin's mother and father are, for the most part, typical middle American middle class parents. Like many other characters in the strip, their relatively down-to-earth and sensible attitudes serve primarily as a foil for Calvin's outlandish behavior. Both parents go through the entire strip unnamed, except as Mom and Dad, or such pet names as Hun and Deer. Watterson has never given Calvin's parents names because, as far as the strip is concerned, they are important only as Calvin's Mom and Dad. Calvin's father is a middle-aged patent attorney who is portrayed as an upstanding middle-class father, as his son might see him. An outdoorsman, he enjoys bike rides and camping trips, and insists that these activities, like Calvin's chores, build character. When Calvin asks him questions, he often makes up outlandish answers, such as, Calvin, why does it, the sun, move from east to west? Dad, solar wind. Calvin, Dad, what makes wind? Dad, tree sneezing. Calvin, really? 
Dad. No, but the real answer is more complicated. Calvin, later to Hobbes. The trees are really sneezing today. The character is closely based on Watterson's own father, who is also a patent attorney, and often told his family that unpleasant things built character. The actual caricature is rumored to be a self-portrait of Watterson himself, minus his facial hair. Watterson has said that he identifies more with this character than with Calvin. Calvin's mother is a stay-at-home parent who is frequently exasperated by Calvin's antics. On the rare occasions when she is not reacting to Calvin's misbehavior, she seems to enjoy quiet activities, such as gardening and reading. The daily disciplinarian, she is frequently the one forced to curb Calvin's destructive tendencies. In one Sunday strip, she allows Calvin to smoke a cigarette in order to teach him how unpleasant smoking can be. She also usually seems sympathetic towards her son's relationship with Hobbes, and a few times has found herself speaking to Hobbes as well. On occasion, Watterson takes the time to flesh out the two parental characters. One example is a storyline in which the family returns from a wedding to find their house broken into. For several strips, Calvin and Hobbes fade into the background, as Mom and Dad reflect on the impact of the event. Calvin's parents drive a purple hatchback similar to an early 1980s Honda Civic or VW Rabbit. The car is the setting of family trips and is occasionally the victim of Calvin's mischief, such as when he pushes the car into a ditch or attempts to sell it. Calvin also has a maternal grandmother and maternal grandfather. A grandfather who smokes is also mentioned, but it is unclear whether he is the maternal or paternal grandfather. None appear in the strip and are only rarely mentioned in dialogue. Calvin also has an Uncle Max, a minor character who figures in one storyline but was not to Watterson's liking and vanished again. Susie Durkins. Susie Durkins, the only character with both first and last names, is a classmate of Calvin who lives in his neighborhood. She first appeared early in the strip as a new student in Calvin's class. In contrast with Calvin, she is polite and diligent in her studies, and her imagination usually seems mild-mannered and civilized, consisting of stereotypical young girl games such as playing house or having tea parties with her stuffed animals. Durkins was the nickname of Watterson's wife's childhood pet, and he liked the name so much he named a character after it. Susie and Calvin's relationship is a constant source of tension. She is frequently the victim of Calvin's derision and plots, and is also often willing to retaliate when provoked. Most commonly, Susie will be the target of Calvin's water balloons or snowballs, and he often goes to great lengths to disgust or annoy Susie. Calvin founded his and Hobbes' secret club, Gross, Get Rid of Slimy Girls, as a general anti-girl organization, but in practice the club is almost invariably dedicated to pestering Susie specifically. Watterson admits that Calvin and Susie have a bit of a nascent crush on each other, and that Susie is inspired by the type of women he himself finds attractive, which has led to speculation that Susie is based on Watterson's wife. Her relationship with Calvin, though, is frequently conflicted and never really becomes sorted out. The love-hate relationship is most obvious in some of the early comics involving Susie and Calvin's relationships, when some punchlines revolved around Susie and Calvin going out of their way to malign each other, followed immediately by each thinking romantic thoughts about the other. Specifically, in an early Valentine's Day strip, Susie seems to appreciate a rather juvenile and insulting card Calvin gives her, and he rejoices when she notices him. Watterson, in retrospect, decided this was a bit heavy-handed and resolved to simply let the two characters bounce off each other in future, to the point of practically removing any romantic subtext. On occasion, Hobbes takes action to attract Susie's romantic attention, often with success and much to Calvin's chagrin. Although on the surface these scenarios take the form of Hobbes teasing Calvin and showing off his charms, they may be Calvin's way to disguise his own crush on Susie by pretending that it is Hobbes's crush instead. Miss Wormwood. Miss Wormwood is Calvin's world-weary teacher, named after the apprentice devil in C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters. 
She perpetually wears polka dotted dresses and is another character who serves as a foil to Calvin's mischief. Miss Wormwood is rarely sympathetic to the trouble Calvin has in school and comes across as a rather strict, sour character. She is quick to send Calvin to the principal's office at the first sign of trouble. She is also a heavy smoker. Rumor has it she's up to two packs a day, unfiltered, mixes different stress-related medications, and is waiting for retirement. Although there is a definite progression of time in the Calvin and Hobbes universe, mainly exhibited by the changing seasons, Calvin and Susie return to Miss Wormwood's first grade class every fall. Rosalind. Rosalind is a high school student and Calvin's official babysitter whenever Calvin's parents need a night out. She is the only babysitter able to tolerate Calvin's antics, which she uses to demand raises and advances from Calvin's desperate parents. She is also, according to Watterson, the only person Calvin truly fears. Certainly she is his equal in cunning and doesn't hesitate to play as dirty as he does. Watterson originally created her as a nameless, one-shot character and did not plan for her to appear again, but Watterson wanted to retain her unique ability to intimidate Calvin, and so she made many more appearances. Rosalind's idea of babysitting is to put Calvin to bed at 6.30, and she has little patience for his attempts to rebel against her. Calvin will often freak out whenever he hears that Rosalind is going to be babysitting him, in one instance screaming nonstop for an entire strip and generally attempts to cause as much trouble as possible. In the final Rosalind story, however, the traditional war is averted by a game of Calvin Ball, in which Rosalind proves to be a formidable player, and once again trumps Calvin with a clever move in the last panel. Mo. Mo is the prototypical bully character in Calvin and Hobbes, a six-year-old who shaves, who is always shoving Calvin against walls, demanding his lunch money, and calling him Twinkie. Mo is the only regular character who speaks in an unusual font. His frequently monosyllabic dialogue is shown in crude lowercase letters. Watterson describes Mo as every jerk I've ever known. While Rosalind is frequently a match for Calvin's plans and serves as perhaps his match on a more strategic and psychological front, Mo seems to be the only character capable of frustrating Calvin to the point of absolute resignation, and operates merely through brute force and physical coercion. Calvin's rare attempts to retaliate have mainly consisted of mocking Mo with words he can't understand. See also secondary characters in Calvin and Hobbes. Recurring subject matter. There are several repeating themes in the work, a few involving Calvin's real life, and many stemming from his incredible imagination. Some of the latter are clearly flights of fancy, while others, like Hobbes, are of an apparently dual nature and don't quite work when presumed real or unreal. Calvin's alter egos. Calvin's hyperactive imagination leads him to imagine himself as other characters with different powers and goals, sometimes vanishing into a fantasy to escape a difficult situation, like a school quiz. It is important to note that Hobbes is not seen taking part in the fantasies involving Calvin's alter egos, other than criticizing his choice of alternate personas. Upon several occasions, Calvin has appeared as either a larger or a smaller version of himself, rampaging through Chagrin Falls, Ohio like Godzilla, or crawling across a book page as Calvin the Human Insect. More frequently, however, his imagination transforms him into a being of a different kind. Calvin's three preferred alternate personas are Stupendous Man, a superhero, Spaceman Spiff, an astronaut and intergalactic explorer, and Tracer Bullet, a private investigator. For details, see secondary characters in Calvin and Hobbes. Monsters Under the Bed At night, Calvin is constantly terrorized by nightmarish creatures apparently living under his bed. Only Calvin and Hobbes are aware of them. There are occasions on which they attempt to bribe Hobbes into handing Calvin over, often with food. There appears to be no continuing theme to their appearance, except that they are very intimidating, but none too bright, and they probably want to eat Calvin. Two of the monsters are named Maurice and Winslow, but it's unexplained whether it's the same monsters throughout the series. Gross 
Gross is Calvin's Anti-Girl Club. The name is an acronym that stands for Get Rid of Slimy Girls. Calvin admits Slimy Girls is a bit redundant, but otherwise it doesn't spell anything. Based in a treehouse, the main objective of Gross is to exclude girls, mostly Calvin's neighbor Susie. Calvin and Hobbs are its only members, and wear newspaper chapeau during meetings. Calvin and Hobbs spend most of their time in the club reworking its constitution and arguing about their excessively bureaucratic roles and titles. Because the club exists specifically to harass girls, they sometimes plan missions to do so. After a mission, they give themselves medals, regardless of whether they succeed or fail. Calvin is Gross's supreme dictator for life, and Hobbs is first tiger. Meal times. Lunch time and dinner time find Calvin eager to share his thoughts about the food he, or anyone else, is eating. Calvin's meals at home are generally depicted as a pile of unidentifiable green goop. Those eating with him are generally repulsed by his colorful descriptions of the cuisine, which is one of the reasons his parents seldom take him to restaurants. He also gives interesting commentary on his food during lunchtime at school, infuriating Susie. He once referred to his dish of beans and franks as cigar butts in a gallstone sauce. Calvin's mother occasionally coaxes him to eat his dinner by informing him that they are serving some outlandish or stomach-turning dish, example, monkey heads, toxic waste, spider pie, which Calvin then eats with relish, though his father usually no longer has an appetite. In the first such comic, however, the parents' roles are reversed. On occasion, his meals are also animate, usually resulting in a fight with said food and leaving a large mess that strains his mother's patience. <laughs>